Welcome and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program for this discussion of Adam Harris's The State Must Provide, Why America's Colleges Have Always Been Unequal and How to Set Them Right. I'm Van Newkirk, Class of 2020 11th Hour Fellow and a Senior Editor at The Atlantic. Thank you to the Education Policy Program for partnering on this event. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the event, uh, please submit them through our Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll save about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A in the event. And more importantly, uh, copies of The State Must Provide, this wonderful book, are available for purchase through our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on the event page. If you already have one, that's great. Uh, if you don't have one, please get one. And if you already have one, get another one for a family member. It's a great gift. And now for the person of the hour, uh, Adam Harris, 2021 National Fellow, is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he has covered education and national politics since 2018, three long years. He was previously a reporter at the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he covered federal education policy and historically Black colleges and universities. Adam, well, thanks so much. I must say, before we begin, uh, you have uh, two HBCU grads talking about uh, HBCUs, about inequality in education, um, and about the development of America's higher education system. Adam, uh, my first question for you is, as an HBCU graduate, what's it feel like to have written this book? You know, I when I set out to write the book, actually, even before I had the idea of, of writing about HBCUs. I, I just, they were sort of the family institutions, right? My mom went to an HBCU, my dad went to an HBCU, both of my sisters went to HBCUs, uncles, aunts. These are the places where, um, these are places that educated my family. Um, and so, you know, to write this book about, um, you know, the sector of institutions that not only for my family, as you know, for your family, how important these institutions have been for, for Black people um, and, and, you know, kind of social, socioeconomic mobility in the Black community. Um, and writing about the ways that these institutions have historically been, um, uh, you know, underfunded uh, and discriminated against while still doing such yeoman's work in, in educating Black students, um, particularly in this moment. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's indescribable. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so I've been, I've known you for years now. I've known how, I've, it's been really neat reading the book and seeing a lot of these individual stories that you've been talking about for years uh, become part of the book. Uh, I wonder if there were things that you thought you might like to write about or things that have been on your mind since you were in school. What, are there things that have motivated or inspired you since then? Yeah, you know, I, I, and at the beginning of the book, I, I write about my experience at a and um, you know, having great professors, having, um, you know, a nurturing community around me, but also seeing some of, of the things, you know, older buildings, um, you know, our, our air conditioning never, see, or, you know, heat never seemed to be working in the winter. Um, the buses never seemed to be running when it was coldest out. You know, they were, they were sort of deferred maintenance on campus and, and all of these sort of different things that um, I saw. And, and I would drive across town, um, you know, Alabama a and in Huntsville, Alabama, um, and there's another institution, another public institution that's about 10 minutes away, University of Alabama, Huntsville, and I remember going there, um, noticing one, their library was open three hours longer, two, they had newer buildings. Um, I le learned later that they had an endowment that was larger than my own institutions, which, you know, had been open for 75 years longer than the University of Alabama, Huntsville had even been an institution. Um, and and it was it was it was sort of jarring to me. And then as I got into covering higher education, I knew that I wanted to cover historically black colleges and universities because it, it felt like there was a story there that was that was being undertold or or um, you know the, the the full picture of of what was going on with the sector wasn't wasn't being told. And and so as I covered you know federal education policy, I really learned the ways that 
um, this wasn't, uh, you know, by happenstance that, that my experience wasn't um, anomalous, uh, you know, that, that going to a and and going over to UAH and seeing the difference that that wasn't an anomaly, but that that was the, you know, very direct result of, of state and federal policy over, you know, over more than a century. That experience of reporting on higher education, uh, I mean, was that kind of validating for you? Did that help you explain parts of your own experience? It really did, um, you know, and, and I, I think when I first learned is over over the time at a in particular, right, a is an 1890 institution. So the 1890s are, are the institutions that are, are land grant universities, the HBCUs that are land grant universities. And, and for so long, I knew that a and was founded in 1875, but um, I was like, so what exactly was it about 1890 that was such a such a big deal? Um, and the sort of the easy explanation for it is 1890 is when HBCUs, when states received money to, to help fund HBCUs. But as I started poking around and, you know, you look at an institution like Auburn, which is also a land grant university, and then you look at a and and it's like, there's, there's this vast disparity in resources, even though both of these are land grants. And what I learned was, you know, you go back even further to 1862, when Congress passes the first Morrill Act. And, um, so they, they give states land, expropriated land from Native Americans um, taken through lopsided treaties and murder and violence. Um, and they gave this land um, to states that they could sell in order to fund an institution. But those institutions, of course, could not be attended by Black students. And this is, you gotta think about it, this is the largest investment that the federal government ever made in America's colleges. And, um, and it was it was a lopsided investment, and so by 1890, um, you know, there's this acknowledgement that well, you, these institutions aren't enrolling black students, um, and and so in the second Morrill Act, when predominantly white institutions wanted more money, um, they went back to the government, and the government said, well, we will give you more money, but you have to at least create a separate institution for black students, or at least endow a separate institution for black students. Um, and so, you know, not only did those predominantly white institutions have that pot to start with and 30 years to build on that pot, but then they also received additional money, money when, when, you know, the land grant, the black land grants were given additional funding. And it really, it, it, it solidified this idea that, that, again, this was not an anomaly, that, that it really validated the idea that that the federal government and state governments have had a hand in not only creating this unequal system that we live with, but but also as I reported it out, dug into court cases, dug through um, you know uh, old records, um, state audits. You really learn the ways that states and the federal government defended, um, sustained, and maintained the system over the last century. One thing you do a really good job of in the book is showing how. Uh, like you said, the roots of this, of higher education in America uh, and this initial investment by the federal government came at a time when it, you know, most Black people in the country could have been put to death just for reading. Um, and that's a really stark and uh, frank way to put that. Uh, it is, it, what was your, uh, you know, thinking behind how you portrayed this history. I know it's billed as a history of inequality of higher education, but it also doubles as a, just a pretty good history of higher education. Yeah, I, I think what I, what I really wanted to do was not only explain the experience of just simply like black colleges, but I also wanted to explain how black students were sort of isolated in higher education more generally and the ways that discrimination manifested itself in higher education. So not only saying that, um, you know, HBCUs were discriminated against Alcorn states receiving fewer appropriations, but also looking at the ways that states broke apart integrated institutions. So I look at Berea College, you know, the first integrated co-educational college in the South, um, and the way that their mission, that original mission, kind of built out of um, Acts uh, chapter two, saying God have made the, of one blood all the people of the earth. Um, and, and the only way that that mission was broken apart was through state action. Going back even further to say, 
um, to look at the ways that even sort of abolitionist minded scholars at different institutions were unwilling to support black education, looking at the ways that philanthropy also failed um, black education. Um, and, and so like you, like you say, it's, I, I think too often we think of HBCUs in this way that's like this is sort of a parochial offshoot of higher education as opposed to like an integral part of it. And, and you know, the reason why this book, I wanted to make sure this book felt more holistic. It, it felt like a more robust look at, at higher education and discrimination in higher education as it stands is because it's like, no, it's, they are, these institutions, this sector of institution is doing work in educating a population that the rest of higher education, a lot of higher education does not, you know. Um, and I also, you know, I, I look at community colleges because the way that stratification works now is the institutions with the most resources have the fewest black students and the institutions with the fewest resources have the most. And that includes community colleges in, you know, a state like North Carolina, more than 70% of um, black students in North Carolina go to the five HBCUs or the community colleges in the state. And so, you know, I really wanted a robust look at, at higher education inequality in higher ed. So uh, as those of you who have read and those of you who will read will probably pick up, uh, I think if I had to identify a single main character in the book, it's actually Berea College. Uh, it's the story of the institution. Why was that particular school and institution and its history so important for this larger narrative? You know, when I first learned the story of Berea College, um, it struck me as fascinating because, you know, Berea and its founder, John Fee, you know, he actually shows up in some of the, um, some of the slave narratives in the 1930s when people are saying, uh, you know, formerly enslaved people say that, yeah, John Fee, this was a, a true believer. This was a, an actual abolitionist. So I was already sort of interested in, in his story. And the more I learned about the development of that institution and its, its current iteration, right? The fact that it has been tuition free since 1892. Um, the fact that it is, you know, trying to get back to that place, you know, this was, a, a place that where its founder was literally run out of town before the Civil War by enslavers. Um, and, and he came back to form an institution, integrated co-educational institution that was effectively 50-50, you know, half white students, half black students until the late 1800s, early 1900s when um, the state passed the day law, which, which was aimed only at Berea College because it was the only integrated institution there. Um, and I've always been really interested in how they clawed back that original mission, how, and, and it, it hinges in large part on the fact that they had that original mission of equity, of equality in the, in that, in the middle of the century. And so, you know, the rest of higher education isn't necessarily built on those same ideals. And so they're having to learn them anew. And, and so you, you can kind of look at a place like Berea and say, it's possible, you know, the, the, what, um, you're trying to more broadly move to, if you're trying to more broadly move towards equity and equality in higher education, it's actually possible. Um, you just have to have that, that sort of um, rooting mission. Um, and and I, I hoped to, to sort of take that mission throughout the, the full book. Yeah, one thing you make really clear is just how, uh, frankly, rare that kind of rooting mission has been in higher education. Um, I think it stands out that Berea College, uh, up until, I mean, maybe ever still, is one of the few institutions founded uh, on uh, equal education, on uh, providing uh, education to people of all races at the same time in the same place. Uh, and uh, it's one of the few that was not necessarily dragged kicking and screaming into the era of integration or, in the case of lots of schools, not really drag at all. Um, what do you think made that kind of, why was that mission so rare? Why was it something that we didn't see pop up uh, in more places or at least uh, that it wasn't allowed to flourish in other places? Yeah, um, you know, a, a lot of it, um, especially for, you know, the, and of course the, the mid, uh, 19th century, so 1850s, 1860s, you know, you, you have the, the violent um, 
uh, pro-slavery wing and, and that, that's really um, suppressing any, any forms of, of, of integration or, or you know, equal rights. Um, and then, you know, as you, as Southern states start to rejoin the union, you have places like the University of Mississippi that where the professors say they would actually rather resign than to educate a single black student on their campus. Um, and, and so you, you, you have that, um, that sort of thread running through, um, running through really the, the, the middle of the 19th or the, the 20th century um, until it sort of enters the federal lexicon that um, you cannot discriminate against students based on, based on race. And then these institutions start saying, oh, well, you know, you have to start looking at our student population. We have 1% black students, 2% black students. Um, and, and, you know, only when that federal policy started to change did institutions start to, um, you know, really kind of get their act together. But even, even in that reality, right, institutions sort of remain as segregated as conditions allow. So, um, for instance, a place like Auburn University, which has known, you know, at least since the middle of the 1980s, that it has had issues with its enrollment of Black students, right? On the same day that Bo Jackson is named the Heisman as the best college football player in the country, um, there, the, a federal judge says that Auburn is the most in, uh, segregated institution in the state of Alabama. They had about, you know, two or three percent black students at that time. You fast forward to 2002, they have about four or five percent black students. But now, today, they have fewer black students than they did in total number than they did in 2002. And, and so it's like this sort of complacency that states have gotten to, where they just assume that the federal government um, is not going to investigate these sort of vestiges of discrimination, um, it just kind of continues to imbue these systems. And, and, you know, the fact that Berea had that original mission and that most institutions did not, I actually think plays a pretty significant role in, in the reality that those institutions have today. One thing I think the state must provide does better than any book I've read in a, a long time is it shows the absolute levels of absurdity and contortion that white institutions had to go through to maintain Jim Crow law. You know, I think a lot of people, as you learn it, um, it it's, it's, you know, you, you think about water fountains and, and you think about separate interests, which themselves are absurd levels of, of dedication to, to, the, to the form. But when you're reading the story of George McLaurin and, and you're reading these stories of people in classes where they're building literal rails between the students, uh, then it really becomes, you see this level of almost, I don't wanna say comedic because it's not very funny, but absurd dedication to preserving this thing. Why were they fighting so hard to preserve it? You know, it's it, it's interesting, and, and I'm glad you pointed to, to George McLaurin's story because you know there was one point where Thurgood Marshall comes down to Oklahoma to see where George McLaurin is. He was like, "That man was sitting. That man is sitting in the hallway." Um, and and you have you have other students in class learning, and and it really is this sort of dedication to. Um, to segregation. And, and oftentimes, like the University of Oklahoma said, well, our hands are tied because the state law says that, you know, we have to maintain segregation. So we have to, you know, figure out ways to segregate with and, and also abide by what the Supreme Court is telling us. But, you know, even so, the first major decision, the first kind of major higher education decision came down in you know, the, the late 1930s in the Gaines case. And they said that states at least needed to provide a separate option for Black students in the state, which is actually remarkable that you, you end up having, you know, Ada Louise Sipple Fisher's case and George McLaurin's case, because those cases are proof positive that even after the Supreme Court said, you at least need to have a separate option, that states weren't even creating a separate option. Um, and so it was really, um, it was really this sort of commitment to to maintaining this inequality um, that that I think that you know we often sort of gloss over 
and and um it's like you know okay the slavery happened and then you have the the 13th 14th and 15th amendment and then things change a little bit but then you have jim crow and then you have brown v board of education but but in the meantime there were all of these little things that were happening all of these ways to preserve the status quo um that institutions were not just sort of passive partners in but that they were active participants in um and and you know in a lot of ways i it's sort of proof positive of this the way that these institutions need to atone for um for the ways that they were were active participants in in that system of of um segregation yeah one of the things that i am uh was really impressed by in reading was just how in, in in the playbook of every single institution dedicated to segregation, uh, stalling was such an important part of the package. And, and it seems to me, especially when you think about the actual uh, instructions on the order that came with Brown v. Board, um, there has not been, even now, a whole lot of deliberate speed in um, creating uh, any sort of just or equal environment. And one thing you do really well in the book is show that in every single juncture, even outside of these really big cases, it's outside of Plessy v. Ferguson, outside of uh, Brown v. Board, and outside of the fight for affirmative action, it takes positive, difficult action from Black folks and from advocates of Black folks to force those institutions' hand and force them to move. Was it ever, I don't know, frustrating for you? <laughs> Oftentimes. I mean, it, it, anytime you are, you're having to think about the levels, you know, and extent that folks had to go to, I, I mean, I was most affected, you know, writing about Lloyd Gaines and researching about Lloyd Gaines, because you really see the toll that it not only, that it took on people, um, you know, the, the, the levels that they had to go to in order to fight for basic rights. You know, he was just trying to go to law school in the state where he lived. And, you know, he, their build, their, or their places on the University of Missouri's campus named for him now, but he was never able to step foot on that campus. And I, it is, it was incredibly frustrating. Um, but also like there's, there's always a piece of it that's, it's like, yes, I, I know that, you know, we come from a, a, a legacy of people who, who really fought for their rights, but, you know, knowing that they should not have had to do all of that, they should not have had to give up all of these years of their life fighting for something that that is a basic right of theirs. Um, you know, he was just trying to continue his education. Ada Louise Sipple Fisher was just trying to continue her education. And, you know, she started that fight in 1945 and wasn't, in, you know, enrolling in the University of Oklahoma's law school until, you know, 1950. Um, uh, you know, the, the Ayers case, right? It started in 1975. And you don't get to a settlement until 2001. And even that settlement is, is incomplete. So the amount of time that, that people had to spend fighting for, for basic rights, it, you know, it, it, it was. There were a lot of times where, you know, you just kind of have to stop and, and, and take a breath and go walk around the house and, <laughs> and play with the kids because it, it, it can get incredibly frustrating. So I want to remind everybody uh, before I ask my next question uh, that the Q&A form is open. If you have any questions uh, and you want me to, to ask them in the last 15 minutes of this event, just put them down in a form on Zoom. Uh, one of the, uh, if you haven't read again, uh, one of the things about the book that uh, is also interesting and striking is you tell it you tell the story of higher education through what are really a bunch of small biographies. What was it important for you to center these stories of people in this larger, big, you know, clash of institutions and forces? It was um, in part because I think we often we often think of higher education as like this abstract thing. Um, and it's in the same way that people 
Um, they don't like higher education, but they love their local college, right? Um, because they see their local college. They can connect to their local college. They're the personal stories, their friends, their family that attended their local college. Um, I, I think that our, our tendency to make higher education abstract really pulls away from our ability to see the people who, um, who make up higher education and who have fought to make higher education more equitable. And I wanted, I wanted people to be able to, to connect with, with those people, with their stories, right? So I could, I could have written about, you know, okay, the Morrill Act passed and uh, Iowa was the first state to accept the land grant. And this is how Iowa State was formed and it didn't enroll any black students and, you know, move on to the next thing. But you, I can also give you, the first black student who enrolled at Iowa State, what the experience was like for him. And, and of course, George Washington Carver is the first black student to enroll at Iowa State. And, and he doesn't enroll there until 30 years after they accept the land grant. And only because the federal government is like, well, you, you either need to create a separate school for black students or um, enroll black students in your university. And so I think you know the importance of stories, the importance of you know connecting that at, on a sort of human level with with the people. Um, I, I really wanted the humans to sort of shine through and and in, um, in the book. Now I know you've been reporting on all this for a very long time now, um, and you know all the ins and outs. You probably knew the rough shape the book would take for, take for a long time. But is there anything that you came across while you were researching and reporting that surprised you? <laughs> yeah, um, so a couple of things. I mean, uh, we, we talked a little bit about like the lengths that states went to, to um, maintain segregation. So like the little details. So when, when the state of Oklahoma, when the federal government Supreme Court's like, well, you guys need to create at least a separate law school for Ada Louise Simple Fisher or enroll her at um, the University of Oklahoma School of Law. The state of Oklahoma created a law school in five days. Um, you know, they, they said, okay, we're gonna use a floor of the, of the Capitol building and um, we're gonna hire three part-time professors for what will be full-time work. And um, we're going to create a curriculum and, and this is going to be equal to the school that's been around for 50 years. And so even when, you know, you sort of know intellectually that states were going you know, as, as far as they could to stymie Black education, it's jarring to see the um, kind of at a granular level, like that in practice. Um, and it's also jarring, you know, even if I knew the broad outlines of the day law, I knew the broad outlines of, you know, how states segregated education to see up close and to dig in the archives, see what people are saying in the newspapers in the early 1900s about why they're segregating um, was, was remarkable. And then again, to see the ways that states and the federal government have studied their underfunding of HBCUs in particular um, for years and years. So to, to, to see that you know, they've studied this and they've known about these issues. And then they just sort of let them sit and let the institutions languish. Um, like Kentucky, they did a study of, of uh, Kentucky Normal and Industrial Institute, now Kentucky State University in the early 1900s. Um, and so the fact that, you know, you still see some of those same problems today that, that you know, this research is coming down was identifying in the early 1900s. Is, is really galling and, and was jarring to, to see as I was researching the book. One of the people who uh, gets a little bit of the biographical treatment in the book is Carter G. Woodson. And uh, it made me think about the lineage, the tradition really to which this book belongs. There's a, been a lot of scholarship, a lot of uh, work situating black education as kind of the cornerstone, or maybe not the cornerstone, but the, the, the thing around which all of the rest of education policy is built and influenced on, whether that's positive or, or in segregation, negative. Uh, how does it feel for you now to be a published part of that tradition, have something where 
your children, where people who are going to be attending universities can are going to be able to go to the libraries and, and, and check out for years and generations to come. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it was while I, I went to the bookstore on on pub day and I saw the book there. It's like, you know, you know, people can buy this book. My 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 brother went to you know Barnes and Noble in, in Ohio and and picked up the book and you know, did a Facebook Live. Uh, and so that that part of it in itself is is kind of surreal. But but thinking about this this more general intellectual tradition. Um, right, this book would not be possible without the work of, of scholars, of journalists, of researchers, you know, past who, who have really cataloged and, and thought critically about, um, about Black education, about education policy. And as you say, you know, right, if, if we are to move towards a, a more equitable education policy in America, not only in higher education, but also K-12, uh, you know, the foundations of that kind of really hinge on whether or not um, the most, you know, marginalized, minoritized populations in those spheres um, are being treated equitably. And, and so, I don't know, situating, situating this book you know, and, and having it in conversation with, you know, with these titles that, you know, I grew up with and um, is, is, is remarkable. And I, I think that my, my hope is that this book can at least, um, you know, speak to someone so that they might want to kind of take up the mantle from here and, and, and dig in a little bit deeper. Um, uh, and, and, and so to, to kind of continue this, this conversation. Again, I don't want to give away too much about the book, although, I mean, I think you all kind of know where this ends, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the status quo is, is, there's been a lot written about it. We know that uh, it's, we're not just talking about the legacy of white supremacy and segregation, we're talking about very real structures that still exist um, and in some ways are even more powerful and intractable today. So I'm sorry if you came to this session and didn't know that, um, but uh, I'm sorry to spoil that for you. But I do want to point out one part of the book that did that got me to thinking a little bit um, and uh, I'm still going over and over again in my mind. During uh, George McLaurin's fight to integrate the University of Oklahoma, uh, one thing one of the officials in opposition to him said, and I'm reading from uh, the book, um, it says he argued that desegregation would make discrimination by individuals more robust and intense. And he argues, and I think it's kind of, you know, it's obviously a self-serving argument, that the state in illegally enforcing segregation was not trying to humiliate and degrade McLaurin. Instead, it was doing his black citizens a favor. Now we can toss aside the, the, the part that's obviously self-serving for the state. Uh, we can toss it aside, but this argument that the legal enforcement, the legal creation of segregation kept a sort of individual level racism at bay, that seems like a sort of accidentally profound observation in some sense. Um, as we look at school systems today that have created a de facto segregation that is as strong in many cases as Jim Crow was. Uh, I don't really have a question behind that, um, just an observation I thought was, um, that, that got me to thinking. Yeah, and and it's it's been interesting to see the ways that the cycle um it's almost like the momentum that the system of segregation had is, is sort of perpetual right there's there's still several states that haven't proven to the federal government that they have desegregated their higher education systems in part because of how they treat their black colleges um in part because of things like unnecessary program duplication and and all of these kind of wonky things but at their at their root you know, it, it kind of comes back to enrollment. It comes back to um, finances. And uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting over the last several years to see how um, you've had this sort of increasing stratification um, where, you know, resources in higher education, like I said, are sort of concentrated in um, these institutions that tend to have the, the fewest black students. And, um, you know, until, 
there is a concerted effort to break that cycle, you know, a, a, an effort that is as strong as the moment, momentum from segregation that was push, that's kind of pushing against it. Um, you know, I, I fear that we won't have, um, there won't be that, that sort of genuine equity and equality that, that you know, one might hope for in, in the higher education system. Now, in the past few years, we have seen in the past couple of years, a spike in enrollment in some HBCUs. We've seen things like mega donors like Mackenzie Scott, uh, who is giving millions and millions of dollars to institutions. We've seen what appears to be a moment uh, for Black college attendees and graduates in the last couple of years, but that sits kind of uneasily with how your book ends when we talk about the clock that's ticking that's due next year for Mississippi, for funding in Mississippi. How do you square your conclusions on the policy and the piece and, and what most people would say is a feel good error right now for HBCUs at least? Yeah, um, and as you mentioned, like 2020 was a record year for a lot of HBCUs in terms of philanthropic giving, in terms of attention this year, right? HBCUs are expecting about $3 billion. And, you know, in a typical year, it would cost about 15 programs. They get about a billion dollars from the federal government. So, um, you know, it is a, a sort of uh, a moment that HBCUs are in the spotlight and they have not been in the spotlight like this for a sustained period like this um, in the past. But I, I also, the reason, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm hesitant to, to look at last year's philanthropic giving and think that, oh, this is this is fantastic. It's be, was, is in part because, you know, an institution like my own wasn't the, the recipient of, you know, one of those large gifts. There are a lot of HBCUs that were not recipients of those large gifts. Um, and then on top of that, you know, in 2021, the Chronicle of Philanthropy has this database of, you know, the largest donations, um, uh, period, but also to, to colleges and universities. If you look at that list this year, um, you know, the top 100 gifts, gifts above $5 million, there, there may be one or two of them that are to historically Black colleges and universities. And so, you know, the idea that that one year was going to address this, this historical pattern of segregation um, uh, is, is, I think that we would, it would be to the sector's detriment and it would also um, be a sort of fallacy if we were to understand that last year as, as changing the entire narrative. Of course, there are some HBCUs that are, that are thriving in this moment, um, but they are thriving in spite of that historical discrimination, not, um, not sort of because things have changed so radically that everything is okay. And that does fit in with the ultimate conclusions in the book, because I think it, what you show in the end is essentially the system is, is held together and moved by every couple of years, these band-aids, right? These, these uh, you get a infusion of funding from a lawsuit, you get a breakthrough in a lawsuit for inclusion, you get a uh, half-hearted affirmative action um, uh, mandate from the federal government. On what level do you think we should be thinking uh, as if we really want to, uh, I guess it's a little bit too pat to say create equality, but to actually address some of these structural inequalities? Yeah, I, I think, you know, on, on one level, it's important for state governments to accept sort of the responsibility for, for their role in creating and fostering um, um, and equitable systems. Um, it's also on the federal government for, for creating the environment that allowed it, right? When, when Elizabeth Warren was running for president, um, you know, I, I spoke with, with Heather McGee um, and, and she, she told me something, you know, uh, uh, that was, you know, public policy created um, the racial wealth gap um, and only public policy can fix. It. And in, in a lot of ways, public policy is what created um, or at least allowed for this system of an equitable education to exist. And so public policy is going to be necessary to fix that. Um, but then there's also the responsibility that, that some of these institutions have, right? The institutions that were actively blocking and stymieing ed Black education while, you know, HBCUs were, were doing the work of educating Black students. So you look at a state like Mississippi where, you know, the Ayers Settlement um, 
sort of came and, and will now be going, phasing out. Um, the Black colleges got $500 million over 17 years, but between three institutions, um, where the University of Mississippi can make $500 million in you know, five years of private donation. Um, and, and if you go back to the 1800s and mid 1800s when the University of Mississippi was keeping black students out and you look at a place like Alcorn State that was educating those black students um, in 1871 they were supposed to get a guaranteed appropriation for a decade of $50,000 a year. Um, four years later when the, you know, uh, the so called redeemers sweep in and with their quote, quote unquote white revolution. Um, they reduced that appropriation to $15,000 a year. The next year, $5,500 a year. And so you, you sort of see the ways that that inequality is, is sort of stacked up. And you start to ask yourself, well, do not only state and federal governments have a, have a sort of role in um, making this system more equal, but also do, do these institutions that profited and um, flourished in the era of, of slavery and segregation, do they have a responsibility to, to help the institutions that, that um, served Black students when they would? Yeah, I, I want to remind the audience, uh, I'm going to go to Q&A shortly. So if you do have any questions, uh, please drop them in uh, the form in Zoom. Uh, last couple questions. First of all, uh, the state must provide. Where is the quote? Where's the title come from? So the quote comes from uh, the Fisher, A.W. Simple Fisher case, um, where they said the state must provide an equal education for her as soon as it does for, for any other student. And, and that's really the, the crux of this, because as much as this is about, uh, you know, a history of higher education, as much as it's a history of HBCUs, as much as it's sort of an examination of inequality, it's really about that, the, the students, because the, the institutions you know, exist to serve those those students. And, um, you know, as I write in the introduction, you know, higher education has a dirty open secret. It's never given Black students an equal chance to succeed. And, and, um, and so the state must provide really grows out of um, that, that notion that the state must provide an equal education for Black students as soon as it does for anyone else. And, and that has not been a practical reality. Now, last question from me, and then I will turn it to our uh, Q&A here. One of the really elemental things that moved me when reading was seeing all these stories of, uh, going back to what we talked about before, uh, you know, this story begins in an era when Black folks could have been put to death for reading, and yet they read. And yet they learned, and yet in the span of a couple years after the end of slavery, there were several institutions of higher education, not only run for them, but run by them. And you saw uh, a really unprecedented proliferation of education, of, of the quest for education among people for whom it seems so dangerous and difficult to seek that uh, attainment. What I want to ask as, as we go into the audience questions is, has that, has seeing all those stories, has living, seeing through all those people's eyes, has it made a mark on you? And, you know, I don't, I, I think questions about hope and optimism are uh, a little, you know, not for me, um, but, <laughs> uh, what is what do those stories mean to you? Yeah, I think you know they really they really show the resilience of of black people through through time. I, I mean, and and you know, fast forwarding to to now, I, I often think about what folks have been through. Um, you know the amount it took to to sort of fight for for basic rights and and knowing that in in some ways this book is is a continuation of of that that sort of push for for equity and equality and, and, and higher education and I think that for me as I was as I was reporting this book out as I was digging into the archives I I really got a sense of you know okay. I'm staying up a little bit late at night to, to finish writing, but, but you know, not too long ago, right? You know, my, my grandfather's grandfather's generation 
um, you know, this would have not this not this wouldn't have been a possibility for them. Um, and so it, it's like knowing what we've been through, knowing that you know states would literally you know, you could literally be killed for being found with a book. Um, you know, for a period of time, they wouldn't even allow Black people to read the Bible um, because they feared a revolution if, if Black people were reading. Um, and I think it, it, for, for forecasting forward, I think that it really shows that even after I'm gone, the fight kind of continues, the sort of push for, for equity and equality continues. Um, and um, it's almost kind of comforting knowing that, but it's also a little bit knowing that it's been going on for so long is in some ways depressing. So there's like this, this mix of like, like knowing that it's been going on for so long is kind of depressing, but also knowing that people have, have dedicated their lives to this and continue to fight. Um, uh, actually does sort of provide a form of hope. Now I have an audience question that will segue directly from that response, which is it's from Alex. And it's uh, what readings or writers inspired you the most while writing them? Hmm. So a couple. Um, I think at the, at the root, it's like uh, Du Bois, I, I read um, Black Reconstruction and sort of his examination of sort of the education pieces of, of that. And then also, you know, reading and, and really kind of digging in deeply to the ideas around um, Black education and how people were thinking about Black education in the early 1900s. As you know, um, the Atlantic's archives are full of, you know, the debates between Du Bois and, and Booker T. Washington and thinking about, you know, on the trainings of, of, of um, Black men and, um, you know, forecasting forward, thinking about the writings of, of Carter G. Woodson on Black education. Um, and then even more, more currently, um, there's some really great histories of HBCUs that I actually have on my shelves here. Um, sorry. Um, so like Bobby Lovett's um, America's um, Historically Black Colleges and Universities, a narrative history from 1837 to 2009 um, was massive. Um, the origins of federal support in higher education um, really sort of helped me kind of cement some of the ideas um, around the ways that the, the Morrill Act was, was structured and, and how the federal government got involved and has stayed involved in higher education, how that sort of excluded Black students. So, I mean, there were, there were a range of, of folks who I was leaning on. As I said, it's sort of um, you know, even even up to now, um, Catherine Weedle's uh, uh, dissertation on um, on the Second Morrill Act, um, uh, you know, from Illumina Foundation, incredibly helpful in helping me think about um, um, you know the ways that that the federal government has has um, sort of stymied Black education, um, even as it was sort of you know, creaking the door open, right? It, it was never willing to, to kind of throw the door wide open, but it, it would at least sort of unlock it a little bit. Uh, now, question from Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa says, thank you for this conversation. I am really enjoying Adam's book and wanted to ask him, given the incredible resistance to integrated higher education, how long do you think we'll be, we'll be living with this legacy of stolen public resources? Hmm. I think, as long as, and in, in some ways, right? So in the late 1960s, early 1970s, um, through court action, the federal government really started enforcing its policies on discrimination in higher education systems. And, and so until there is an environment where, where states realize that they cannot kind of continue this, um, uh, this cycle that has momentum, of, um, of sort of believing that the federal government um, will not strictly adhere, enforce um, uh, these laws that are on the books that, that bar discrimination. I think that we will continue to see, you know, um, 
the states sort of be complacent, right? There, there are a couple of ways that states can get out of, of federal monitoring. And one of them is through these, these settlements that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so Maryland has recently settled with its HBCUs. Um, they offered $577 million over 10 years, but between four colleges. Um, and we really start to do the math. It's like, okay, over 10 years, it's like, all right, that's, that's $57 million a year, $57.7 million a year. Um, um, you know, you got me doing math on the fly here, but that's like, you know, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars for each institution. Um, and so when you really start to, or, or twelve and thirteen million dollars, which is for each institution. And so when you really start to break that down, you see how, you know, if that's supposed to make up for a legacy of and the, the vestiges of discrimination, that's going to be wholly insufficient. Um, and so until you start to have a real accounting for for you know the damage that has been done and the fact that these institutions have been able to um, persist and and produce successful graduates um, and educate you know black people in spite of this, this sort of um, regime the Jim Crow regime that they lived under um, is is a testament to the institutions but also should be a um, uh, a sort of wake up call to say that what would these institutions have been able to done if they were provided with the resources they were just supposed to receive. Um, and I think the more we, we ask these questions, the more we have these conversations, um, you know, the better off we will be in the long run and maybe the more we'll move towards a, a sort of equity. What were some of your favorite sources to work with in your research and your reporting? Um, newspapers. Uh, so I really enjoyed digging through, uh, digging through old newspapers. And, you know, you, you always had to figure out the political bent of, of the news sources. And, um, and, and so, you know, you would read, uh, like the Utah Wagon Observer, and then you would go over and read like the Utah Democrat, they would have two completely different perspectives. Um, and, and you, you really kind of had to, to, um, square it down and, and pare it down to, okay, what's, what is the base roots of this? Where, where is this paper coming from? So I really liked digging into to the news archives because you would always, and on top of like finding the interesting thing that was relevant to the book, you, you know, you would and inevitably run across an interesting story like, you know, person throws 13,000 pound boulder like across the Mississippi or something like that, you know. Um, but you would, you would run into these interesting stories. So I really liked working with newspaper archives, but I also like digging through um, Supreme Court records at the, um, uh, um, just over at the Library of Congress and seeing like the internal conversations that the justices were having about affirmative action, seeing the letters that were flying back and forth where, you know, Thurgood Marshall says that, you know, what this case hinges on when he's talking about the Baki case is, um, you know, it really hinges on whether you think of this as, you know, we're keeping students out or whether you're thinking about it as students who have historically been excluded, you know, getting in. So, you know, and, you know, the way that he and four other justices thought about that case was, it was about people getting in. These are, these are people who institutions have not enrolled, who have, institutions have actively kept out of, of these seats. And so, yes, it will take some time. We, we need to take race into account in order to get past race, right? It's the exact same thing that um, was written in the Atlantic in 1977, right? In order to get past race, you must first take account of race. Um, and so to, to see that working with those archives was, was really interesting and um, illuminating for the book. All right, we have a question from Anna uh, and asks, what lesson does the educational model of HBCUs offer for the non-HBCUs that now educate a majority of black students in higher education today? Yeah, I, I think, um, so Jelani Favors has a really great book, um, uh, is Shelter in a Storm. Um, and, you know, he talks about the sort of second curriculum um, that HBCU students often receive, um, that it's not just about the, you know, learning the arts and the sciences and all of this, but it's, it's about learning how to navigate in, in the world, how to navigate the sort of um, dearth of resources you might receive, how to navigate, navigate the job market, and, and um, how to navigate racism. Um, and, and not from a place of, okay, we're going to throw you into an, an environment where you're just going to face racism but but really sort of nurturing the students and I think um, you know the the sort of emphasis that sort of um, 
uh, mentorship that, that students get from HBCUs oftentimes, right? I, I, Van, I'm sure you had this, this experience where, you know, I remember there were days where I would just walk over to the Department of Behavioral Sciences at the time and just sit and hang out with professors and talk um, and like just kind of sit in their offices, not during office hours, um, because it was sort of built into the mission of the institution that um, these were, um, these were places where, you know, that, that sort of extra mentorship was, was not peripheral to the job of, of the HBCU professor, but it was, it was sort of almost central to, to that position. And, you know, you have to think about what the rest of higher education is right now, where you have a series, and I mean, of course, this is also, these are issues that face HBCUs as well, but, you know, the sort of emphasis on, um, you know, getting to getting to the next level, um, and then also the racism that that black professors are facing at their at their institutions, where it's like, I, you know, I'm also trying to navigate um, racism within within my institution while trying to help students, and it becomes this additional burden. So, so I think the the more work that institutions can do to make themselves, um, you know, more equitable, not just for students but for faculty, um, create a better working environment for faculty, so that they they can do that extra um, kind of that extra work, and then also kind of compensating them for that extra work. Um, I think that the better off um, those institutions will be, as well as the students who attend them. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, you know, a large share of Black students now are at community colleges. Um, and so the more states can do to um, fund community colleges, provide resources to community colleges so that, you know, they can have those additional supports that students need in order to be successful, the better off students and, and those institutions will be. Yeah, I named my kid after one of the presidents of my HBCU, so um, I'm all in on the uh, sort of extra, extra legacy um, <laughs> of them. Absolutely. Uh, Benjamin Elijah, yeah. Um, what's one thing you wish you knew or understood better before you started the book? Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the process of writing the book is, or, you know, writing a book generally is advantage, you know, it's kind of like, it's an exploration. And you know, you never know what you um, what you don't know until you you know that you don't know it or you didn't know it. And and so you know, all of the little things as I mentioned a little earlier, kind of about the the extent that states went to, um, you know, Oklahoma rushing a law school into existence in five days. Um, uh, you know, what a, a reintegration of Berea College looked like. How an institution that had this original mission sort of reclaims that mission. Um, um, after integration, uh, I, I think all of those, all of those little things, uh, I, I, I think, added to the experience of writing the book, and, and in some ways made the experience a, a you know pretty fruitful and, and interesting learning experience for me too. So. Um, I, I hope that, that readers, um, I hope that in my writing and that, that readers can sort of get that, you know, in some ways this was, this, this was a learning experience for, for me too. And, and um, I, I tried to pour as much of what I learned into, into the book. And uh, the last question, I'll save this one for me um, before we uh, wrap up. Uh, who is your ideal reader? Who do you hope gets their hands on this book the most? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, of course, you, you hope that policymakers read this book. You hope that college leaders read this book. Um, but really, I, I hope that anyone interested in history, anyone interested in understanding um, the ways that, um, you know, the machinations of slavery and Jim Crow and the systems that they created did not sort of um, end when um, overt um, you know, de jure uh, discrimination did. Uh, they did not end when slavery ended. Um, but people who are interested in, in understanding how a system of higher education, the, the, the colleges, higher education that, that, you know, the founders are really talking about higher education as the place to build good citizen, how over time um, Black people have been systematically excluded from the, the, the greatest benefits of that. Um, so honestly, anyone who is generally interested in, um, in that sort of accounting of history, I, I'd hope would read the book. 
Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a very busy week, so thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you everyone who uh, joined us on the Zoom today. And there is still time. Please go and order a copy of the book at Solid State Books. Uh, even if you already have a copy, get another one. Thank you all for coming and uh, see you later. Take care. Thanks.